Ladies and gentlemen, angry Americans around the country and around the world, Happy New Year. Welcome back. 2021 is starting off a lot like 2020 ended with chaos and tumult and really important issues that I think transcend politics, transcend partisanship, transcend geographic barriers, and we need to break it down with someone who we talked to last year um, that was a voice of reason and inspiration and insight. And I think we need now, especially with what's, what's, what's unfolding by the minute in Washington and across this country. So I'm very happy to welcome back the great and powerful uh, Secretary Chuck Hagel. How are you, sir? Welcome back and Happy New Year. Oh, Paul, thank you. Always good to be back with you and share, uh, share a couple of minutes of thought with you and appreciate what you and uh, all your team, all your people do. Well, we're trying to always bring light to the heat, right? And there's a lot of heat happening right now. As we're recording this uh, on late Wednesday, uh, chaos is unfolding in the Capitol. Uh, it's something that I've warned folks could unfold. I frankly thought it might happen after the election, but it looks like it's coming two months later as the election is more formally finalized. Um, but I, I just want to give you a chance. You know, you're a guy who's always brought light to hot situations. What's your, your initial reaction to what we're seeing unfold in the Capitol right now, sir? Well, I suspect, I suspect I'm like any American, Paul. Uh, I, I'm so disgusted. Uh, what we're seeing is shameful. What we're seeing is happening in the United States of America, in Washington, D.C., our nation's capital. We would expect that uh, out of some dictatorship somewhere else around the world, but not in America. And so I'm disappointed, very, very disappointed in, in what's going on in our country today. The good news is we have an opportunity to turn this around, to self-correct. And I think uh, that'll be a plus here as a new president, new administration, a new Congress uh, take their offices on January 20th. Uh, all Americans should be disgusted by this and be shamed by this, embarrassed by this, be outraged by this. And, and so it's now a matter of let's, let's get on with it. Let's leave this baggage behind. We're better than this. Uh, we all know we are. Let's prove we are. Let's do what, what this country needs to do and lead again, take care of our, our problems and, and, and fix the issues that need fixing, get along, stop the paralysis and Put the nation first, not the Republican Party or Democratic Party or a president, but the country first. You got to compromise. That's the way democracies work. So that's the message I want to hear. I know you want to convey. Um, but right now, there may be armed people inside the Capitol. You've been a senator, uh, you've been the Secretary of Defense. You've been at the Pentagon when, uh, you know, traumatic and, and trying events are unfolding as best you can, obviously, given operational security and other concerns. Can you talk through to maybe civilians or folks who are more disconnected? What's the Pentagon doing right now? I've, I've said we can look to our military. We can look to our Secret Service. We can look to the Capitol Hill police. I think they will rise to this moment, even if our politicians don't. Uh, and, and that's part of your op-ed that I want to talk about afterward. But can you break down? What's the military, as much as you can, what are they doing right now to deal with this and other comparable threats to our national security? Well, first of all, and, and we'll talk more about the op-ed you referred to here in a couple minutes, but uh, the military, the United States military role uh, is not to be a policeman uh, internally in our country. Um, the military should have nothing to do with elections. Uh, those are state uh, control, state administered, local control, local administered. That's the way it should be. Police have responsibility. Different security uh, uh, dynamics of a government have responsibility. Uh, homeland security. But the Pentagon, our U.S. military, should never be involved in something like this uh, because the military's role is the defense of this nation outside the country. We have police organizations in many different kinds of police organizations. We have a Department of Homeland Security, Homeland Security. Uh, we've got the National Guard that governors can use in particular situations. But this is why, partly why this episode is so dangerous, 
because it blurs the line of what responsibilities the military has and what they don't have. And that was one of the points in this op-ed that my nine uh, former Secretary of Defense colleagues and I wrote about don't get the military involved in this. We've never done that. It's, it's against our, our laws. It's against the Constitution. Keep the military out. The military needs to be above all that. We'll end with this, Paul, and you know this because the oath of office you took. Uh, every member of our military, every elected official, ev everyone who serves this country in any capacity, when they enter that service, they take an oath of office. The oath of the office is to the Constitution, not to a president, not to a right. commander in chief, not to a party, but to the laws of this land. There's, we need to, there's where we need to make a clear divide between military responsibility and police responsibility. So, sir, I think a lot of folks are going to see this unfolding and they're going to think back to the last time there was unrest in D.C. And, you know, Trump pushed hard, right? He came down with the National Guard. They tear gassed peaceful protesters. We talked about it. He walked out with the Secretary of Defense and, and the Chairman of the Joint Chiefs. Since then, Trump has, you know, purged the Pentagon of Esper and anybody who's not a political ally. General Milley is still there. And we're hoping he's there to hold the line and, frankly, to keep uh, what I, who I've called President Mayhem kind of away from the gun chest, right? Like if our military is the gun chest, he's the guard dog. He's got to stay there and say, all right, stay away from our guns. But what happens now, sir, if the president comes in and says, hey, back off, let him do this? Or if he says, you know, uh, you know go out and, and, and snatch up voting machines. He's saying these things out loud. Right. And, and that's part of what motivated you to write that piece, I'm sure. But can you talk through what will happen in the chain of command if the president says, hypothetically, go snatch voting machines and, hey, back off the protesters. They're, they're just trying to express their rights with guns in the Capitol. Well, um, I have confidence, great confidence, always have had in our military leadership and in our men and women in the military to honor that oath of office they took. Uh, and to honor uh, and to carefully carry out the, the rightful orders uh, of a commander in chief. Now, they have an option. If that order was given to, to Chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, Milley, to go do what you just mentioned, uh, he could disobey that order. And I believe he would. And I believe he should. Uh, uh, because that's wrong. That, that's, that's an illegal order. That's the order of our military to do something that constitutionally is against the law to do. And we would have to rely on our military to do the right thing, to be courageous and stand up and say, no, sir, that's not our role. Uh, I believe that Millie, I believe our, all of our senior leaders uh, would do that. And I, I hope it would never ever, as everybody does, come to something like that. And that's why all of this is so dangerous, Paul. What's going on in the Capitol, what's behind this, having these Republican congressmen and senators challenge the certification of the electors from 50 states that came together a couple of weeks ago to certify the election results in each of those states. And they were very clear. There was no issue. There was no fraud, uh, no facts that, that, that there was fraud or anybody stole an election, but yet, the President of the United States is inciting people to do what's going on in Washington, D.C. Uh, today. And why these Republicans will continue to play with that, uh, not all of them, but some in the House and Senate, to essentially question the electors' certification and throw out the election results. Th that's just insanity. That is irresponsibility of the highest order. And I, I have confidence we'll get through it. This is a messy, messy time for our country in light of everything else we're going through, this pandemic that's crippled our economy and all the other issues that we've got, not including the foreign policy issues, the national security issues that our military needs to be ready for, whether it's North Korea, Iran, China, whatever it is. So it's this entire environment that we're looking at. We've got to bring some, some wise, steady, careful leadership to our country, especially at this time. And, and I, think, I think we'll see that. I think enough Republicans and Democrats will join in that poll. Uh, as we swear in a new president and a new Congress, I, I think that's what most people in this country want. 
uh, and I think that's that's what's going to happen. But it's going to get messy, and we may have some more problems here, big problems, before it's over. So as we move through the messy, you know, we need the unity and the calm and the patriotism that transcends party line. And you are a Republican. You signed on to this really unprecedented, historic, urgent op-ed with every other living Secretary of Defense. We've never seen anything like it, I think, in American history. And it's you on the same op-ed uh, with Ash Carter, uh, with Mark Esper, who just left, also with Dick Cheney and Don Rumsfeld. I mean, this is this is every living Secretary of Defense from very different political backgrounds together sounding the alarm, right? Or, or, or maybe drawing yeah. a line, or I'll let you frame it. But uh, it, as the president hits every single guardrail, the guardrails seem to be holding for now, right? And we hope they'll hold for another couple of weeks. But, but why did you guys come together to say this? And how did it happen? Can you talk us through the mechanics of like, how do you and Dick Cheney and Rumsfeld and, mm -hmm. you know, you guys aren't, you know, quarantining together. How does, how does a big statement like this, you know, go around? Is there a quarterback or how does that come to the point where you, you unite in this very important way? Well, it, it came to me and I think it came to most of my uh, colleagues. I've not spoken to all of them. I've spoken to some of them in similar ways. It came to me uh, uh, from, uh, two uh, former senior uh, Pentagon officials uh, who worked in the uh, in the Republican administrations, uh, Dov uh, Zakam and Eric Edelman, and then also they brought in uh, Elliot Cohen, and uh, they came to me with the idea, and uh, with the first draft of the op-ed. Then, then uh, I understand they wanted to go to the Cheney because they all had a relationship with Cheney. A lot of them would work with Cheney to see what. Cheney thought of that because Cheney and Rumsfeld are the two senior members of the of the former secretaries who've been around longer, who, who were the, the longest, not longest serving, but were the, the, the senior, the, the ones who were in the most senior past administrations. And then uh, others started getting, Leon Panetta, other, others started getting calls. And that's that's the way it started with me. And what did I think? Let us give you a draft so on and so on, what changes do you think we should make? That, that's how it started with me. I can't answer for the rest of my colleagues, but I think in the end, uh, what we all did agree on uh, very clearly uh, was the threat to this country that we saw. And the, the necessary, I, we thought, uh, comments in that we could make in an op-ed joining together about what is the role of the military. The military has no role in elections or electoral process. Uh, and also to reaffirm to all those in military uniform today, uh, don't forget your obligations, your responsibilities. You take an oath of office to the Constitution, not to a commander in chief, not to a party, not to a president. And don't forget that. I think also it was a message to the American people. Hmm. The, the citizens of this country must remember what our democracy says, that we are a nation of laws. We follow that laws. If we don't like those laws, we have ways to change it, legal ways to change it. And, and I think it was all of that wrapped up into one thought that I think most of us all thought that probably was a good idea hmm. to post that op-ed and also a unifying message too, coming from 10 different people with different political philosophies, different political backgrounds, work for Democrats, work for Republicans. But if we could all join together, yeah. and, and maybe all 10 of us, based on our experiences, would have something to say that people could respect and listen to, maybe it was worthwhile. Mm. It, it was really, uh, it, was, it was an example, I think, of what we need. And I, I could feel that you guys were talking to the troops. Right. You were talking to the folks to kind of cut through the Trump nonsense, cut through the news, have it in writing, have this, you know, formidable group. that's kind of like the Avengers or like, the, I don't know, the weirdest softball team on the planet. Right. Like the idea of the 10 of you together on a Slack channel or a Google Doc, like adding comments is pretty fascinating, but also, you know, underscores. Uh, the threat we have from this president who's busted all the norms, who's politicized our military 
And, and I hope that unity will carry forward uh, in the next couple of months because I think we're, we're going to need it. We're going to need more people to speak out, especially Republicans um, and especially folks who've been quiet for a while, like Cheney, right? Everybody was surprised to see him, was surprised to see Rumsfeld. But that's how bad it's gotten. As it's this bad, I want to ask you, sir, many, especially folks that are disconnected from the military because of the civil military divide, are especially concerned about a general uh, now being nominated again to lead the Pentagon. So this is not happening in a vacuum, right? Uh, Biden has now nominated um, General Lloyd uh, to be uh, uh, the next secretary after we got an exemption for Mattis, which hadn't been done since, you know, Marshall. Um, I'm concerned about it. And I know many veterans are concerned about it because we want a civilian who's had disconnected time and space. We don't want a rotating ship where they go out of the uniform and directly into the SECDEF position. You've been in that chair, um, but you were also, you know, a young enlisted guy in Vietnam. You weren't a four star. Can, can you tell me, uh, should, I, should I be less worried? Should we be less worried? Uh, and, and if so, why? Well, the points you make, Paul, are very relevant points. Very important points. Um, I'll give you my my take on this. I'll start with with General Lloyd Austin first, the person, the military professional. Uh, I worked very closely with General Austin when I was at the Pentagon. He was a commander of of Cent Central Command, the dip, the most difficult command of all because it's where all the hot spots are. Right. Other than North Korea, uh, he is a true professional soldier. Uh, high quality, integrity, uh, decent man, good man, but right, right at the top of every general officer I ever worked with. Now, that said, and I, and I will support him, but that said, uh, I, I agree with you that I don't think that we should be uh, asking career military flag officers fairly soon out of the Pentagon, especially, uh, to be the Secretary of Defense. Uh, there are a lot of reasons for that, but one is that job is a political job, Secretary of Defense. I mean, you, you don't need to know every component of the military, the Army and Marines. You got to know enough, but you got 950 admirals and generals that you can call upon and, and, and thousands of other top people. It's a political job because you, you've got to navigate in the Congress between the Republicans, the Democrats, conservatives, liberals, the committees, armed services, appropriations, all have their ideas about what should happen, not happen. You've got the White House, the National Security uh, Council, always trying to overreach. I mean, uh, Bob Gates and Leon Panetta wrote books that mentioned both of that, the overreach. And I saw it. I mean, every president wants to reach into the Pentagon and get some control of the Pentagon. I don't think that's healthy. I think you've got to have an independent Pentagon because it's, it shouldn't be about politics. So you've got to know how to navigate all that. You've got your own internal politics. Each service is, a, is, a, is an empire and, and you deal with all the politics inside that. You're dealing with the politics of the career uh, employees, the career Defense Department employees which is a major force, and the media, and the media. Right. Uh, and you got to handle that right. The media needs to know what's going on, but they can't know everything, obviously. But you need to, you need to give them as much access as you can give them, uh, but not everything. So when you add all that up, plus managing the day-to-day -day operations of that place, the biggest enterprise in the world, um, I'm not sure the best training for that is 40 years in the Army or, or, or in the Marine Corps or, or anything else. And that's not degrading the great service and great leadership of these people. I know a lot of very, very senior military who doesn't think it's a good idea. And plus, then you add a new issue into the confirmation process. You go through a waiver. Now, there are some Democrats that have already said, we're not going to vote for the waiver, even though they're Democrats. Uh, I suspect he will uh, get uh, confirmed. I, and you'll get the waiver, but that's just a needless debate that you don't have to have. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think because we are in such dire need of leadership everywhere, the, the Pentagon, that institution has been decimated over the last four years of, of, of leadership, just ripped apart. Uh, look at it now. And uh, all our institutions in Washington 
have been. So I think it's really important that we get General Austin confirmed and give him an opportunity to do it. But And, and I will support that. But in the end, I just don't think it's a it, it's wise to put a, a general or an admiral in that job. I, I so appreciate your perspective because you've seen all sides of this. And it, it's not a command, right? It's, it's no. a very political job. And it reminds me a lot of when Shinseki went from chief of staff of the Army to the VA. And you worked alongside, yep. you saw how he struggled with Congress and with the VSOs, and especially yep. with the media, right? It is a very different uh, skill set. But if, if it came down to it, sir, I, I always see you as, you know, a guy that so many of us who've been enlisted and been in the military root for because you're, you know, you're the great success story. You were an enlisted grunt in Vietnam and you became the Secretary of Defense. If you were still in the Senate, would you vote to approve him and the waiver or would you vote no? Uh, I would I would vote to approve the waiver and vote for him. And I'll tell you why. Even though I have my feelings about that, I think this country is in such a precarious situation right now. If that nomination is defeated or if the waiver is not passed, then you go back through the whole process again yeah. and you're going to be another month or two months, maybe more, without a leader. If, if Lloyd Austin was a different kind of a guy, if I didn't think he had the character and the integrity uh, and the professionalism that I saw working with him very closely for more than two years, then, then I'd feel differently. But I think we're in a, a spot now uh, where, where almost we, we've got to do this. But mm -hmm. if I had a chance to do it over, and if mm -hmm. I had the authority, that's not the direction I'd go. Yeah, I really appreciate you saying that too, because I, it feels like an unforced error from, from Biden. I mean, it's not about Lloyd Austin. He's an exceptional guy, yeah, right? right. And, 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 and making it about him almost makes it unfair to him, right? It, it's, it's, right. it's beyond him. And, and uh, it's, not, it, it's so beyond him. And, and explaining that, especially now in this environment, is really difficult, frankly, especially for veterans who are trying to explain the Pentagon and the civil military divide in the age of Trump. So I'm rooting for him. But if I were in the Senate, I would, I would vote no just on that principle and also yep. to kind of teach the politicians a lesson. You know, Trump's blown through so many norms. This is another norm that he blew through that maybe Biden has a chance to correct. So, you know, we'll all root for him. It is politics. I got to ask you while I've got you, sir, speaking of politics, the other major story is Georgia. Uh, you were a, a moderate uh, in a red state for a long time. You were a Republican working for a Democrat president. Uh, you've been, for many, uh, you know, the closest thing to an independent voice we've had over the last couple of decades. But what's your take on Georgia? Uh, and it's a special election, so it's, it's a lot to pull out of it. But what's your take on Georgia and really where the Republican Party that you, you know, once claimed proudly stands? Well, I think a couple of answers to that, uh, uh, Paul. I think it's uh, very indicative, Georgia is, um, of the volatility of our politics today mm -hmm. in this country. That uh, you can't take a state for granted uh, nearly the same way that maybe we did uh, over the last few years, 20 years. Uh, as Bob Dylan once said, these, these times they are a changing, baby, and they are a changing. And, and I think that, that Georgia election turnout, both for Trump and those two Senate seats, those results are very clear indications of that. Uh, and I think that's good. I think we, we are thinking through things more. Uh, and we're not just being categorized, well, uh, that state will probably be this way because it's this way because you have a, a percentage of black and Hispanic and white Americans and so on and so on. No, I think we're seeing what we've been striving for for 200 years, the integration of this, so we break that down. We're all Americans first, let's start there. I don't care what you know, your color is, your religion or anything else. Uh, that's where we start. So I think that's good. Second, on the Republican Party, they're in a mess. Uh, and they've been in a mess. I, I mean, Trump didn't start that. He was a consequence of it. I saw it in the last mm -hmm. few years of my Senate career, uh, Paul, I saw how the, the, the really the right wing of the Republican Party was strangling the party and the Tea Party. Uh, either you vote 100 percent down the line on what we say or we'll run a primary opponent against you. This kind of absolutism, it's like a religion. We're absolutely right all the time. You're absolutely wrong all the time. Well, democracies have to work. 
by listening to everybody and compromising. Everybody's got opinions and everybody's not right all the time. Mm. And so uh, this has been coming. The Republican Party is going to have to do some really major soul searching. Uh, who's going to be the new leader or leaders? First of all, who do we, what do we stand for? When I, when I joined the Republican Party and have been a Republican all my life, I still am, I guess, in name only, because I don't know what the Republican Party stands for today. But the, the, the principles of the Republican Party were fiscal responsibility, uh, free trade, international engagement, strong alliances and, and allies, strong national defense. Well, we've got strong national defense, but the other four are gone. They haven't been around the Republican Party for years and years and years. And so... Uh, they've got to figure out who they are, what they represent, what they want to be, who the, who the leaders are. And if they continue to go back to Trump, all that's going to do is just produce more Democrat victories. Uh, so, sir, where, 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 where do we go? Guys like you and me and gals and guys out there that kind of feel the same, you know, maybe they were more moderate Republicans or maybe they're politically homeless, they're unaffiliated, they're independent. Um, where do we go? Like, I'm unaffiliated right now. That's my choice. I'm looking for yeah. other options. Where do you recommend we go, frankly, to, to continue to, to gain, uh, frankly, a voice, right? Like there's a bit of a loss of power of the independence because we're not united and because we're so fragmented. So where do we go? And also, is there anything else coming down the pipe you think we should look for? Uh, maybe it's not in the news. It's not on the radar as folks are seeing this chaos. Anything they should be watching for or looking for that you can recommend? Well, uh, Paul, I think uh, answering your question, probably uh, two things. Uh, uh, give the Biden administration a chance uh, to do what they are uh, sworn into office to do, help lead the country, as well as give the Republicans uh, in the Congress, now that Trump is gone, a chance. And it appears they're going to be in the minority in the Senate. Uh, now they are in the minority in the House. Give them a, uh, them a chance to have new leaders ascend and see where they want to go and see where all this is gonna go. If we have this conversation a year from now, I think it'll be a lot clearer mm. on some of your questions that you're asking. Yeah. I mean, where do you go? Where do you look to? Well, we'll see if the Republicans rise to the occasion. Uh, we'll see what Biden and his administration can do and the Democrats. Last point I'd make on this, I think you will see uh, uh, some unprecedented cooperation mm. between Republicans and Democrats uh, going into this year. If no other reason, the American public is sick of what we've been going through. They are sick of it. They're sick of the paralysis, the nastiness, the divide, and all that goes with that, and the polarization of our communities and our people. That's not who Americans are. Mm. I mean, we're hopeful people. I mean, we've got the left and the right. We get all that. But we've always had that. But you get along. You make it work. So I'm optimistic as, as much as we're going through right now, and sometimes it's hard to be optimistic, but I am. But, but it's uh, it just great being with you, Paul, like always. And I really appreciate the, the I appreciate time. One it's last great. alibi for you. There is no third party option here. We asked this of all our returning guests. It's a tough one. Pancakes or waffles, sir? Which one would you pick and why? <laughs> well, I'll give you an answer that you'll say is typically a, a, a senatorial uh, political answer. I like them both. Uh, but you got to pick one. You got to pick uh, one. Yeah, well, I, I, I get that. And um, <laughs> third parties, uh, you know, they've kind of inched in a little bit here and there. And I think the volatility, as I mentioned earlier, of our politics today is open to any anything. I mean, I think you, you could write uh, two or three different scenarios, Paul, uh, over the next four years. What would, it, what would things look like in four years in 2024 on a presidential run? I wouldn't dismiss any of them because I think it's that volatile. Social media has changed the landscape too. I don't have to tell you, it has totally changed the landscape. Money and politics has so corrupted so much of it. So there are so many variables in this thing. Leadership, uh, where the country is, what's the country looking for? Um, so that's, uh, but, uh, we but feel, that's, I think, I think you represent a voice of many right now and I'm grateful for, but you, you won't, you won't get, if you had to pick pancakes or waffles, so I can't pin you down to pick one. Yeah, I, I'd probably pick pancakes. There you go. <laughs> I knew, I knew I could get it out of you. 
I knew we could get it out of you, you know, and, and that's the one thing I'm making folks choose on, on right now, but <laughs> I, I'm really uh, grateful for your time, especially right now with all that's going on. I know you got a lot of, the, I hope that we see you in the administration in some way. I know you and Joe Biden spent a lot of time together in the Senate. I hope he's calling you. I think you can help speak to many parts of America that maybe he can't. So I look especially to you, and I've mentioned Bob Carey and others. I'm thinking a lot about Max Cleland this week, who I know you served with as well. Um, I think these voices from, from that time that really transcended party and, and have that military background as well could be really powerful, and you're one of the most powerful of them. So thank you for your continued patriotism, you. leadership, and friendship, uh, and, and thank you for all you do for this country, sir. We appreciate you. Well, thank you, Paul, and keep doing what you guys are doing. You're an important voice, a very important voice, especially now. Take care of yourselves. Happy New Year. Yes, sir. Happy New Year. Stay frosty, and thank you, sir.